Hello and welcome to this film which is all about buffer solutions. Now hopefully by the end of it you'll know what we mean by a buffer solution. But not only that but how we can make one and how we can explain how a buffer solution is able to do its job. And we're going to do that in terms of conjugate pairs which we should know plenty about. And we're also going to understand hopefully what is meant by the term buffering capacity. Okay so first of all we'll start off by looking at really quite an important definition. So this is what a buffer is, okay? And that is a solution whose pH will not change substantially when we add small amounts of acid and base, okay? Now, how are we gonna make a solution like this? Well, if you've got a solution whose pH doesn't really change when you add acid or base to it, then there must be something in that solution that is able to react with acids and with bases and basically neutralize them. So how could we design a solution like that? Well if you want something that's going to react with acids you'd put base into your solution. If you want something that's going to react with bases you put an acid in there. The trouble with putting an acid and a base together in one solution is that they'll often just react with one another, neutralize each other and leave you with nothing to react with acids or bases in your solution. So we've got to be a little bit careful about what we choose here. So if we have a look at what we've got here, we've got a weak acid. Now, we know that weak acids, when, we're, when they're placed in solution, don't ionise very much. And you can see here that most of these weak acid molecules are remaining in their unionised state in the solution. Okay? One of them, it looks like, has turned into an H3O plus ion, so it must have reacted with water but generally they're all unionized. So in other words, this thing that we put in remains pretty much in that state. That will obviously react with bases. So we need something that will react with acids. Now, we want a base, but not a base that's gonna react with this acid. So why don't we choose the conjugate base of that acid? Okay, so perhaps if this was ethanoic acid, this might be sodium ethanoate. And now all of a sudden, We've got lots of ethanoate ions in our solution. We've got lots of ethanoic acid molecules in our solution. And we've got a solution that contains something that reacts with acids and something that reacts with bases. So that's how we make one. Let's see how we would explain how they're able to do their job. Now, we'll kind of start off by focusing on a buffer like the one we've just seen, so that is one that contains ethanoic acid and ethanoate ions. Absolutely key to answering questions like these is making sure that you can write an equilibrium that involves that conjugate pair. Now there's often more than one way of doing that, um, and that's okay. We're just showing you one way for now, and then we're going to look at the other way. But here we've got ethanoic acid reacting with water, producing ethanoate ions and H3O plus ions. Now we know a bit about um, acids and bases, we know a bit about equilibrium principles as well, and not only that, but we know about collision theory. So if we were asked what would happen to this buffer solution, which contains these and these, if we added acid to it, let's consider what effect it's going to have on the rate of these two reactions and on the position of equilibrium. So if we add H+, the concentration of H3O plus ions increases. That increases the frequency of collisions between these, increases, increases the rate of the backward reaction. The forward reaction's rate hasn't changed because we haven't changed the concentration of either of these. So we're going to favour the backward reaction. That backward reaction consumes H3O+. So in other words, if we add acid to this solution, the equilibrium will move to the left for the reasons just discussed, and that will remove acid from the solution. So basically our conjugate base is reacting with the acid. If we add hydroxide ions, now all of a sudden things have become a little bit more complicated because there aren't any hydroxide ions in this equation. So we can't talk about how their increased concentration is going to affect the rate of anything. But if we know that OH- ions will react with H3O plus ions, then we can write an equation to show that they're going to turn into water. And so if we add OH- ions, the concentration of H3O plus will fall. That will cause the rate of the backward reaction to fall because these two things collide less often. These two things are still colliding just as often, so the rate of the forward reaction hasn't changed, but now it's going faster than the backward one. And so when we add base 
and remove H3O+, the forward reaction will be favoured and it will put H3O plus back into the solution and hey presto, the pH won't change very much and so the solution is acting as a buffer. Now as we just said, we could write this equilibrium in a different way. Um, so here we've got the ethanoic acid again. But this time we've got hydroxide ions in our equation and that's okay. It just means that the products are going to be slightly different. We've still got here the conjugate pair of ethanoic acid and this time we've made water. Now, if we add OH minus ions, it's a bit simpler with this equation because we've got OH minus ions in the equation. And so if we increase the concentration of these OH minus ions, then these reactant molecules are going to collide more often, the forward reaction rate will speed up, product particles won't, their collision frequency won't be affected, so the backward reaction will stay at the same speed, and so the forward reaction is favoured, and that removes the OH minus that we've added. So basically the ethanoic acid is kind of reacting with them. Okay. If we're adding H+, plus, again, because we don't have H+, plus in the equation, a little bit more complicated, so let's write an equation for the reaction that takes place between the H plus ions that we've added and the OH minus ions that are actually in the equilibrium, because now we can hopefully say, well, the concentration of these will fall if we add H+, plus. forward reaction rate falls because of this decreased collision frequency, backward reaction is still going at the same rate, so now it's going faster than the forward reaction, so it's going to produce OH- for us in response to the fact that we've added H+. So we've added acid, it's going to produce some base to neutralise that acid. OK, now, as we said earlier, actually we didn't. Um, we've talked about um, buffer solutions being made of weak acids and their conjugate bases. You can also make them from weak bases and their conjugate acids, as we can see here. Okay, we've got a weak base, ammonia, and its conjugate acid, ammonium. Now, you can't just take a solution of ammonium, so you'd have to take some ammonium chloride or something like that, but if you mix ammonia with ammonium chloride, you're going to set up this equilibrium, and once again, you're going to have a buffer solution that can react with acids or bases. How would you explain it? Well, if you add OH- minus ions, you can see there's OH- minus ions here, Okay, so you're going to increase their concentration. These two things are going to collide more often. Backward reaction rate speeds up. Forward reaction rate hasn't changed because we haven't changed the concentration of those two things. And so we add OH-, minus. the backward reaction is favoured, and that removes OH- minus for us. If we add H+, plus, again, maybe starting to sound a little bit repetitive here, H+, plus plus OH- minus makes water. And so by adding H+, plus, we're going to remove some OH-, minus, so this concentration falls, products start colliding less often, backward reaction rate slows down, forward reaction rate is still the same because we haven't changed the concentration of these two, so it's going faster. It's going to give us more OH- minus ions to replace the ones that were removed by this reaction with the acid. Okay, and again, prevent changes in pH from occurring. Quick chat now about why these buffers are important things to us. Mainly these things uh, occur in biological systems where things need a very narrow pH range to work nicely. So for example, um, coral formation and things like that in the ocean um, rely on the pH being within quite a narrow range. Your blood requires quite a narrow range of pH if you're going to survive for any length of time. So it's important mainly in biological systems that we have these solutions which are able to buffer pH because if we start adding acid like we do when we dissolve carbon dioxide in the ocean or when your body produces various acidic substances as a result of respiration or other processes occurring in your body, the pH of these solutions won't change very much because they contain a buffer. Okay and finally what do we mean by buffering capacity? Well, this is a little bit what it sounds like. It's, um, it's how much acid or base we can add to a buffer before its pH will start changing substantially. And in order to have a high buffering capacity, you want a high concentration of your acid and its conjugate base, or your base and its conjugate acid. Not only that, but we want their concentrations to be roughly equal if we're going to get the maximum buffering capacity, because then we've got things that can react with acids, and with bases. So just also make sure that you remember what buffering capacity is and how we can 
affect it. Okay, so hopefully now you've seen a way of explaining how a buffer works in terms of collision theory and equilibrium principles. You know what a buffer is, a few different ways of making a buffer, okay, and you also know what buffering capacity is. If you've got any questions or comments, or if any of it didn't make sense, then please feel free to come and see me or to post a comment on YouTube.